Ordinarily, being a jack of all trades, at least in my eyes, is a negative thing in video games with the selection of a wide variety of characters because, as you inevitably progress towards optimization, it becomes less about the foundational capabilities of a unit and more about the full extent of said capabilities, which are naturally higher for a specialist than a generalist. The best use of the first half of the infamous quote Jack of all trades, master of none, is often during a situation where you're working as a group, the implication being that a team of specialists can make up for each other's deficiencies. However, the full quote is actually Jack of all trades, master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one, referring to someone's ability to cover a lot of bases in the event they don't have a specialist for each group, especially when those bases in question are geared towards a specific outcome. And curiously, that's the direction Genshin Impact is heading in. Entering year 4 of the game's timeline and the number of playable units has increased considerably. Though a good handful of veterans from versions 1 and 2 are still more than competitive today, the expanded roster has raised discourse over opportunity cost, as while the difficulty of the game has more or less remained stagnant, our means of completing its content have become more optimized. A major consequence of our change in perspective of the value of characters is that the need for role compression has gone up, further reinforcing the appeal of already strong characters while breathing new life into others once forgotten. Today I'll be breaking down the aspect of role compression in Genshin and how it's something that all players, casual and hardcore alike, should understand as it can help them ascertain future characters too. While not an official term coined by the game or anything, true to its name, role compression is the concept of having one unit who can do a lot. Whatever form that takes can be left up to interpretation. For me, role compression can either be determined by the quantity of things a character can do or the quality of things a character can do. Which might be a bit confusing, so let me elaborate. Ideally, you want to have a good combination of both. You want someone who can do a lot of things and do a lot of those things very well. Role compression has been a thing ever since the game came out. Units like Xingqiu and Bennett were critically popular for that very reason. Bennett's ability to supply massive amounts of attack and simultaneously regenerate the active character made him a fantastic offensive and defensive support. Likewise, for Xingqiu, he could provide you a stagger resistance, damage reduction, a token amount of healing, follow up hydro damage, and by extension, hydro application. Xingqiu also provided offensive and defensive support. But more importantly, what made them stand out over lesser value Jack of all trades characters like Noel or Diona was that they had the right combination of things you would want for the circumstances in which they would be used. Noel, for instance, despite being an on fielder instead of an off fielder, can do a lot of stuff. She can deal damage, her elemental burst grants a solid area coverage for a melee, she can face tank hits, and she can also heal her team. And while individually those aspects are indeed valuable, an on field attacker should spend more of their attention and power budget on dealing damage rather than being tanky and healing those would be better reserved for off-fielders. What about Diona? Diona is a pretty good unit, not the best but not the worst by any stretch of the imagination. She has a bunch of stuff going for her too, good cryo battery, she can give your team a nice shield, her burst provides you with healing and persistent cryo application for freeze teams, plus she can buff you with more move speed and lower stamina consumption, she can debuff enemy attack, and at C6 you get 200 elemental mastery above half HP. Not bad whatsoever. The thing that invalidates most of that is that Diona is almost exclusively used in freeze teams. Healing and shielding is objectively good, but if enemies are being permafrozen, you're likely not taking damage anyway, which means you're also not being attacked, so the attack debuff she gives to enemies is also kind of pointless. Again, not saying she's a bad character, she's a serviceable all-purpose support, but she doesn't really have the right combination of roles for her cryo support. So to sum it up, role compression is having as many jobs or functions compressed into one character as possible that are both efficient and necessitated or appealing for the environment they'll find themselves in. You can have someone with a ton of roles but not have very much of each one or have the wrong combination. Conversely, you can have someone with a ton of one role but lack everything else. Back in 2022, I made a video talking about exclusive supports, also known as specialists, characters that have one job and focus on doing that one job. In that video, I talked about the pros and cons of being geared towards doing one thing. My main concern was that, in light of the primary method of obtaining characters being to pull for them through gacha, which means money can be potentially involved, it's in the player's best interest to go for units that cover a ton of bases to get the most out of their money. I then went on to mention how the main way for players to feel incentivized to go after them is if they're so much better than their generalist counterparts to make up for that specificity. Mihoyo is well aware of this and overtunes those types of units in the right fields, inadvertently giving them fantastic role compression. Take Milu for example. She is the definition of niche. Full Dentro and Hydro team with the sole focus on making Bloom cores as destructive as possible. But the way in which she empowers them to explode fast and wide for extraordinary damage makes it so her team can pretty much take on any form of content and do it quite well by virtue of having good persistent damage and area coverage, assuming the enemies you're fighting are reasonably nearby. 
other niche characters like Farsan and Lenny have followed suit, with the former being on par with the power 5 in terms of strength if we're being honest, and the latter, while obviously not as support, also being intentionally overtuned to account for his more stringent party needs. At the same time, there are units who made their claim to fame through being a worthwhile if not optimal choice for a lot of different parties. Take Shinobu, she's pretty much the electro silver bullet for Denjo teams, and occasionally more desirable than Fischl on the basis of supplying different forms of electro application, but chief of all, healing, surprisingly hard to find among electro units. Another noteworthy candidate is Kokomi. Once considered a worthless 5-star, she's made a name for herself as one of the most generally versatile units in the entire game, with a perfect arrangement of regeneration and hydro application making her an ideal choice for Bloom, Taser, and Freeze alike. Now, why is roll compression so important? The short answer is power creep, the long answer is that Genshin Impact is advancing, however slowly. Compared to other gacha games, Genshin is one of the most power creep resilient, which we've established is not as a result of them balancing characters, but rather their obstinate refusal to introduce any new form of endgame content. Even so, having day one units like Shinxel and Bennett still be really useful characters is very much appreciated, especially among those without the wherewithal to pull on every banner. I know what some of you are thinking, if Genshin's difficulty in power scaling is the same as it's always been, why is wall compression becoming more prominent? Try to think about it like this. The roads we drive on are pretty much the same now as they've been in the past. It's not like highways and streets are more mechanically demanding now than back in the 1950s. Even so, car manufacturers the world over have been finding new ways to make their vehicles more fuel efficient, higher tech, fancier, and all that stuff. Granted, most of that is for a more enjoyable if not luxurious driving experience and not necessarily getting you from point A to point B more efficiently, but I'm sure you get where I'm going with this. Just because the content hasn't changed, doesn't mean players themselves will progressively expect more from units as they come out. If there are faster or better ways to do something, logic dictates that you'd be remiss to not choose the better option. Such is the nature of power and feature creep. For new content to be appealing and desirable, it has to have new stuff or better stuff than existing content, even if that content doesn't necessitate it. Now that we have an established foundation of the game's mechanics and characters that tap into them, for new units to stand out they'll have to do stuff more efficiently or in a substantially more novel fashion. It's something they've been doing since the very beginning, but I would say it's become more conspicuous entering version 4. When Novelette came out, he almost completely overtook Child and Ayato by leaps and bounds as the best Hydro on-field carry. Apart from simply dealing more damage, the way his kit was engineered made him a more complete package than the other two, his DPS not being entirely dependent on reactions or even other teammates for that matter. On a broader scale, the relative strength of one team compared to the next is being called into question. In past years, it's been somewhat frowned upon to compare one team with another as players were still in the process of developing usable teams. These days, most of us who've been playing for at least a couple years get to pick and choose among half a dozen to a dozen parties, perhaps more. And unless you harbor sentimental reasons to use a certain team, your selection will likely boil down to how easy a team is to use or how effective they are, both factors being greatly influenced by how much role compression its units have. New characters, now more than ever, are being scrutinized for what they can offer for less resources, investment, what have you. The more efficient they are and the more bases they cover, the more value they carry. Damage dealers can pioneer new strategies that were once thought of as unviable or gimmicky, while supports or off-fielders can retroactively increase the practical usability of existing characters by supplementing them with what they lack in addition to the expected power-ups for the current meta. One of the most emblematic examples of the impact of role compression would have to be Farazan. Prior to her, Shao was for all intents a subpar carry, though we did have an established team in Albedo, Bennett, and Shangling or Zhongli, depending on if you wanted more DPS or survivability. His overall damage just couldn't keep up with the more efficient vertical investment attackers who had supports catered to their playstyles like Hu Tao and Ayaka, obtaining Yelan and Shunho, respectively. That all changed when Farazan was added to the game midway through version 3, though the full extent of her supportive faculty essentially mandates unlocking her final constellation if and when that's achieved, she single-handedly transformed Xiao and by extension Wanderer who came out alongside her from a secondary carry to some of the best in the game. How does she accomplish this? By compressing a staggering amount of damage buffs into one character. Understanding that the Swirl reaction isn't known for its DPS component, especially not for Animal itself, Farzone works to increase the effects of every other parameter. Elemental damage, animal resistance, follow-up damage, and stats. Those are the four main ways you can increase your carry's DPS, and she does exactly that. Her elemental burst grants bonus animal damage while shredding the animal res of all nearby parties. Her fourth ascension passive also increases the animal damage of all attacks based off her own attack, further augmenting her carries. Then with their constellation 6, she gives bonus crit damage for all animal based attacks and deals follow up animal damage accompanied by a small grouping effect. Farazan compresses every possible increase in damage imaginable. Anything and everything you want for animal damage, she can provide for you. She's potentially one of the most party slot efficient characters in the game. Of course, she has to be, as her niche is extremely specific and only works for like two characters at the moment. But that is precisely what those two characters need to compensate for the inherent lack of brute strength that animal suffers from. 
Since Farazad can do so much, it gives you a lot of freedom to choose what you want for your remaining party slots. Such freedom can allow you to field highly desirable supports that would otherwise not have been doable in the past in light of needing to cover the essentials. There have been countless times in Genshin where there was a character with a lot of different tools and strength, but were missing one or two things that really could let them shine. Once they acquired those things, it enabled them to tap into the greater network of character building that they otherwise would not have had access to. Vice versa, there's a character who could only do one thing and do that thing extremely well, but there hasn't yet been a set of three characters that could take care of every other base comfortably. As Genshin continues to get more and more optimized, the need for damage dealers who can do more damage and supports who can have to do a lot of things or do things at higher limits becomes greater and greater. The Flex Tape team is a testament to this. The recent addition of Rina has created an entirely new standard of damage augmentation. She possesses enormously high damage amplification, capable of single-handedly buffing her entire team more than two DPS supports combined, perhaps three. By compressing all this power into one character, it made room for Jean, a once mediocre 5-star healer, to become one of the most important healers in the game. Previously, Jean had a tough time finding gainful employment because fielding her would cause you to lose too much damage and efficiency over other healers. It's not that she was a bad unit, it's just that other healers could do more. Bennett gave crazy amounts of attack, Kokomi had more sustained healing through hers being an elemental skill in addition to Hydro being a far broader supportive element, same thing for Shinobu, what with Dendro, stuff like that. But with Arena now in the picture, she provides so much damage that the one advantage Jean has over the other aforementioned healers, that being a massive instant party-wide heal, can better facilitate the immense DPS enhancing buff offered by the Hydro Archon, who in turn can compensate for the loss of damage and or reaction capabilities of Jean. Not just her either, Farina's inclusion has allowed several characters to struggle with falling short in some way. Like I talked about before with Noelle, she has great durability, decent healing, solid uptime, and better area coverage than most other melee normal attackers, but she just doesn't have the damage to compete with the 5 stars. With Farina, now she does, elevating her in value. Though it's always been a thing to consider, role compression will continue to get more paramount from here on out, consequently resulting in teams that used to be good now to no longer be purely from everyone else getting better. Countless times, I get comments from people saying X character or X team is still good because it can 36 star Spiral Abyss. Here's the thing, it's not just about whether or not a team or unit can complete the game's existing content, rather it's how they perform in relation to alternative options. Let's say a couple years from now, there's a new unit who can create a massive zone on the ground that regenerates the entire party's health and boosts all of their attack stats. Sounds like an infinitely better version of Bennett, doesn't it? Well, that's because it is. Therefore, as a result, Bennett will lose value since there's someone who does exactly what he does but better in every conceivable way. Honestly, it doesn't even have to be that big of a disparity. You can have someone who does the exact same thing Bennett does, only they have a summon type elemental skill for off-field damage and application. Even a small extra thing like that could drastically change the landscape of Genshin's team building, as you now have someone who gives the same healing and attack buff that Bennett does, but they can also drive reactions and contribute some extra damage. Suddenly, teams that really wanted to field Bennett but need an off-field elemental application can now afford to have him while satisfying their requirements. They get to have their cake and eat it too. Bottom line, future units will be judged based on how many things they can do, how much of it they can do, and whether or not the things they do contribute towards the right goals. Vice versa, units that don't do as many things or don't do things as well will be seen as suboptimal not because they can no longer clear the content, but because the standard is much higher. They are units who can do stuff faster, more easily, and more efficiently, so on top of how strong they are, it will come down to how party slot efficient they are too. So, role compression was something that was on my mind for a long time. You see it discussed often in other games too, especially when talking about new characters, what they can do better than existing ones. I know it's kind of random, I just thought it would make for an interesting topic. If you have any thoughts on this yourself, feel free to share them in the comments down below. For now though, if you enjoyed the video, it would be great if you could leave a like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, at Varsferum, join my Discord server, and check out my other discussion videos if you haven't yet. But till next time, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.